Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. Good morning, church. Let's start by all closing our eyes and bowing our heads. And if you're waiting for a moment of prayer, it's not to pray. We're going to go on a little journey using our imagination as we tell this story. So imagine for just one moment that you are about to be instituted as the commander of an army and a nation. Your beloved mentor has just passed away, and now over one million people are looking to you for guidance. You've just taken control of this army from him, and he's an absolute legend. And as a new commander, your first military campaign is to go into a new land and take control of a very strong city. You are an experienced fighter, and you've been studying under your mentor for a long time, and you've learned the tactics and the strategies for success. Excited at the prospect of taking on this new land, you set up your drawing board with all the schematics and you're giving a report of your army's strength. You call for a meeting with all the brightest military minds and you start to develop your strategy. The model that you have is prosperity and success. Say that with me, say prosperity and success. As you prepare to go into this battle, the mentor of your mentor, an old man, he interrupts your planning meeting with all your generals and he says it's time for you to see the secrets of a guaranteed victory. You tell him, I don't have time for that. He replies to you, you don't have time for a guarantee of prosperity and success. Your mind begins to stir immediately. You get excited at the idea of what this mentor is about to show you. You ask yourself, does he have a society of secret warriors? A cutting edge piece of technology? Something to give us an edge in battle. Will this weapon be the key to our expanding empire? Brimming with joy, this little old man, he walks you through three sets of hidden doors. And then he says, come closer. And then he says, stop. He tells you to come no further. As he's staring at a smooth wall and he's smiling from ear to ear, staring at nothing. You now begin to wonder, was my mentor's mentor an escapee from a psych ward? Am I about to get killed by a crazy man? We see that the mentor places his hands on a smooth wall and now he begins to chuckle and laugh out loud. And now you surely know that this man is a lunatic. As you get ready to go back to your planning board because he's wasting your time, the walls begin to shake and a huge door begins to open as he places pressure on a hidden compartment. A giant metal box slides down a ramp labeled prosperity and success. And the old man, he asks you for the key. You tell him, I have no key. He reaches up, grabs your necklace, and he rips it off your neck, the necklace that your grandmother gave to you as a child. And before you can yell at him about it, it reveals a key that opens up the box to prosperity and success. He waves you forward and you inch closer and you are brimming with joy at the excitement of this guaranteed victory. Surely you are going to see the enemy's plans, some strategies, or a secret weapon to bring you victory. You look into this box, and your smile turns to absolute disappointment. You see the most disappointing sight of your life. You are tempted to slap this old man back into his childhood. You feel the strength of 20 fed-up aunties. All the aunties said... Amen to that. You even summon up Aunt Jemima to give you the strength to slap this man. And all of a sudden, he reaches into this box, and you can look back at me. And instead of a weapon, he shows you a dusty old book. 
You say to the old man, instead of giving me a secret weapon, you give me a dusty old religious book. And the old man simply tells you, all you have to do, my son, is listen. And you sit there, and you're waiting to hear something, and it's silent. And he says again, listen. And again, you hear nothing. And as you get ready to say, what am I listening for? You hear a voice from heaven say this. In Joshua chapter one, verse one, it says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, here's that voice, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them to the Israelites. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you might be successful wherever you go. Keep this book, everybody say book. He says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you might be careful to do everything that is written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Everybody say prosperity and success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, in case you didn't realize it, I made up the part about Aunt Jemima. There is no part in the Bible where it says that Joshua was talking to a little old man and then got upset. But I, what I wanted to illustrate with this story is that this is kind of an awkward moment in our own minds. Because Joshua is tasked with leading a people into a promised land on a military conquest. And instead of being pointed to the planning board, God points him to his word. And the question I want to ask you today is what is a better foundation for the future of your life? Is it the plans that you can come up with in your own strength? Or is it a better foundation the word of God? And what we see as we look throughout this story is that as the people are going into this promised land following Joshua, that there are things, that there are blessings, there's a covering, there's a provision, a reward that comes with this promised land. But before the people get into the promised land, there are some instructions and guidelines that God gives to them. And today you might feel like God is calling you out to a promised land. You might feel like God is taking you into a new season. You might feel like there's more in store for you that God has today. And to that, first of all, I say amen. And second of all, I want you to know this sermon is for you. And secondly, if you feel like there is no hope for you, like God is done with you, like there's nothing for you to do on this earth, then this sermon is definitely for you. And my hope today is that hope would begin to arise again as you see the story of Joshua. Today, as we continue our sermon series on a summer's journey, we're going to talk about the journey into the promise. The journey into the promise. Now let's bow our heads and pray for real this time. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you so much for the promises that you've given to us in your word. Lord, I thank you that every person in this room and watching online would receive everything that you have in store for them. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open up our hearts and open up our minds to hear you and to see you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So there's this tension here in this passage where God is calling Joshua to lead these people into a promised land. But instead of telling him to go to his strategies, he first tells him to start with his word. And the reality is this can be uncomfortable because if you told me that it was my calling to build a building, I'm not going to reach to a Bible to see how to build a building. I'm going to call a contractor. If it was my calling to start a business, I'm not going to look to the Bible for guidance. I'm going to go to startmybusiness.com. Why would that be the case? 
because that's what makes sense to me. That is the strategy that I would come up with. But we see with Joshua that when he's getting ready to lead the people into the promised land, God does not tell him, start with your plans and then fit me into your plans. He says, start with my word. He says, start with a firm foundation. He says, start with what I'm speaking and then go from there. And the reality is, in order to reach a promised land that God has for us in the room here today, that there must be a shift of a mentality from relying on what we can plan in our own strength to relying on what God is speaking in his word. And as we're going through this sermon, I do not want us to think that planning things out, having a strategy is bad because that's all throughout the Bible as well. What I want to get to today is that God's word is a firm foundation. That when we start with the word of God, we're like a wise man who is building our house on a rock. That when the winds and the waves begin to stand against us, that there's nothing that can destroy that word that God gives. And we see in the book of Deuteronomy, which leads up to this transition where Joshua is taking over the nation of Israel, that Moses is coaching them through, here's how to enter into this next season. What's cool about the book of Deuteronomy is it simply means second law. And if you've heard of the law in the Bible, it's kind of a set of rules and requirements that God gives to his people. And we see in this book of Deuteronomy, the second law, there's not a new set of laws, but what Moses is doing is he's explaining the why behind the laws. He's saying to the nation of Israel, here is why God says what he says in the law. What the book of Deuteronomy really is, is Moses is about to die. And he calls together all the nation and he says, listen to what I'm going to speak to you because these words are going to carry you into the next season. And he starts by reminding the people of all that God has done. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 7, he says this. Moses says, but it was with your own eyes that saw all these great things the Lord has done. Observe, therefore, all the commands I'm giving you today so that you may have the strength to go into the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So he says, the reason why I'm telling you this is to strengthen you to walk into this promised land. Verse 9, and so that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to you, to your ancestors, to give them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, there was not a river of milk that ran through the land. That's kind of nasty. What it means is a place of prosperity. Verse 10, he says this. This is very important. Moses says, the land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in a vegetable garden. So what happened in Egypt was they were very intellectual. They were very smart. They had a really good strategy and set way that they would get their food. So they were very much about the planning board. He says, in Egypt, when it came to your food, your provision, you were able to do that. It was by your works that you could sustain life in Egypt. But watch the contrast of what the promised land is. Verse 11, but the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from heaven. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. Who cares for this new land? Now you're going to a spot where it's not your work that's sustaining you. It's the Lord that's going to sustain you. For the eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. So what happens in Egypt is there's a season where things are and then there's the season of strategy where we go, we strategize, we harvest, and we save up enough to make it to the next harvest. And what Moses is telling the people here, he's saying, if you keep that Egyptian mentality, you're not going to sustain life in the promised land. Because now it is the Lord your God that's going to take care of you. Now it's the Lord your God that's going to sustain you. And if you're in a land 
where you're used to doing everything, and then God says, I need you to trust me on this, you're gonna feel uncomfortable. And maybe in your life, you're used to being the one who sustains everything. And now maybe God is saying, I'm bringing you out of Egypt into the promised land. And here's the thing about the promised land. The promised land is a whole lot better than Egypt, but it requires a whole lot more trust. There's a whole lot more blessings in the promised land, and there's a whole lot more uncertainty. The promised land is a place where you say, it hasn't rained in three days. My tomatoes are looking a little bit ashy. They're a little bit dry, um, and you have to trust the Lord for the rain. And we see all throughout this second law, this book of Deuteronomy, that Moses over and over and over again is outlying to the people that you must rely on God. Because the reality is, it was actually God that brought you up to this point. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Have you ever heard that quote before? Jesus quotes this exact passage when Satan is tempting him and he's saying, Feed yourself. Take it into your own strength. And what Jesus is echoing here is what Moses told the people going into the promised land. That I am sustained by the Lord. Even in the wilderness when the people were complaining, Moses is saying, hey, all the time you were complaining about God, he's the only reason why you made it here. And if it's God that brought you all the way up to the edge of the promised land, Does it naturally follow that now it's time for you to take full control? That now it's time for you to do it on your own? Or is it possible that it was always God who was sustaining everything that was going on? (laughs) Moses isn't saying just imagine into the future. Just picture in the future that God's going to take care of you. No, he says, remember what God did. And sometimes if the present moment looks very cloudy and uncertain, like God's not moving, sometimes you need to look backwards and remember the place that God brought you from. And you can say to yourself, if it is God who brought me all the way here, from all the way there, is it possible that he's the one that's sustaining me even now? And this is what Moses is saying to the people. We're not going to a place where your irrigation and farming skills keep you alive. This is a land where God sustains you. In other words, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Moses gives this message in the book of Deuteronomy, and ultimately he ends with this. He says, listen, blessings I set before you and curses I set before you. You choose. And we see ultimately that Jesus takes on the curse so that we might have the blessing. But we see that Moses encourages the people, rely on God. Take God at his word. And then we get to Joshua, and it says, verse 2, God says to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now you people get ready to cross the Jordan into the land I'm about to give to them. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. And then he says, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do you understand now, seeing the book of Deuteronomy, why God can say to Joshua, do not depart from this message? Because this message points ultimately to who? to God, to Jesus. So if you want to get into the prosperity, who do you look to? God. To get into the future that God has for you, who do you look to? 
God. So the whole message of what's contained in this word is look to God. And we see it kind of summarized in the book of Hebrews when it says, we look forward to Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all a message about how it has always been God who is bringing his people forward, never about the ability of the people. We see that God doesn't tell Joshua that he has to figure it out on his own. He says, he doesn't say, good luck, create something new, figure it out. It's almost like God is saying, surely you didn't make it to the border of this promised land by virtue of your, your, your strategy and your strength. You made it here by reliance on me. So keep trusting in me. We're not going to go into detail. We'll look at the passage today. But in Deuteronomy chapter 9, the people were starting to get a little bit too comfortable with what they were able to do because God was the one who was providing for them. You ever have like an eight or nine year old? No, let's say a five year old, and they threaten to run away from home. Like, I need my iPad time. I'm leaving. There's a little video I saw where this little girl walks out the house. I don't know her name. But she walked out the house, she looked around, and she said, my bad, mom. It's like, you realize and you feel all powerful when you don't realize who's the one who's sustaining you. And that little girl, the moment she walked out the house, she said, wow, maybe I'm not ready to live life on my own. And God says to the people in Deuteronomy 9, he says, do not think that you are here because of your righteousness, because you are a stiff-necked people. It's like the Bible insult version of hard-headed. God said, you are a hard-headed people. And he says essentially two things. You are very hard-headed, yet you are where you need to be. So if you're hard-headed and you're where you need to be, it's because I'm the one who's been doing the work, not you. You didn't make it to the promised land by virtue of your own ability. You made it here by virtue of God's grace. I want you to know that you made it here to church today or you're viewing online today, not by virtue of your own ability to sustain the universe. It's only by the grace of God. And as we look at this story, there's a few keys that we can apply when it comes to building out our our journey into this promised land. Number one, walk away from the planning board. Walk away from the planning board. And I'm not saying throw it away because we're going to get there. But we see in Joshua chapter 6 why we don't always rely on the planning board. It says that the gates of Jericho were secured and barred in because of the Israelites. Verse 2, it says that, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hand, along with its king and fighting men. Verse 3, March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. And for us who know the end of the story, we can say, amen, trust God. But if you were a soldier in that army and you were asking Joshua, what is the strategy for taking this city? And he says, we're gonna put the pastors at the front of the line. We're, we're, we're going to do the Macarena, and we're going to walk around, and we're going to shout on the seventh day. You know what an army would say as that strategy? They would say, Joshua, I know you're in charge, but it sounds like this is a plan of Hennessy more than a plan of God. It's absolutely crazy. It's like, all right, Joshua, what's the plan? We, gon- we just going to walk in a circle um, six times, and then on the seventh time, we're going to shout. And that plan makes absolutely no sense, and it's worthless, except for the fact that it was based on a word. 
So it says in verse 6, even though Joshua must have known how crazy he would sound, that Joshua called the priests and he said to them, take up the ark. He didn't ask them. He didn't say, hey, what do you guys think? He says, take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance. He's like, this is not up for interpretation. He says, go, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark. And if you've seen the end of this story, the walls fall down and the people get exactly what God had in store for them. Now, if they would have had their own plans, they probably would have said, all right, we, we've got to siege the city, surround it, and cut off all supplies for half a year. Sometimes sieges would go on for multiple years, but God says, no. In my plan, we're doing this in seven days. And what I love about this story is that God gives them a word. The walls fall down as they do that word, but then it says that the men went in and they had to fight. Now, the Bible is very clear that the fighting that they trained in the wilderness, they planned in the wilderness. They had companies and they had strategies in the wilderness. So the point of this message is not to say, sit back, don't plan, don't train, God will take care of it. The question I want to ask today is this, are you simply trying to fit God's word into your plan? Or is God's word the thing that holds your plan up? It is the word of God that sustains the plan. It is the word of God that is the firm foundation. And the amazing thing about the word of God is he's the one that's responsible for seeing it happen. So having a word from God is not a box that keeps you stuck. It blows the box wide open. And it says, I have this guarantee in the form of this word. All right, Lord, now where do we go? All right, what ideas can we come up with? What things can we build on top of this word? The second thing I want to make clear today is to trust the author. Trust the author, and that's the second point. Proverbs 3.1 says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. So this is kind of like Moses to the Israel. It's now a father to a son again. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Verse 3, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on a tablet of your heart. Sounds really familiar, right? He's saying, keep this word. For then you will win favor in a good name in the sight of God and man. Verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. We see that Jesus is the author of this story called life, and he set us up wonderfully with God's word. And that's the third point today, follow God's word. It's very clear in the book of Deuteronomy that God's word and the laws that were set were not a way for the people to earn God's blessings. It was the guardrails to stop them from departing in the wrong direction. If you look through the book of Deuteronomy, it's over and over and over and over and over again where Moses is like, when you go into a land, destroy all the idols, destroy the places of worship, destroy anything that is going to point you away from God. It wasn't like God was concerned about smashing stones into pieces. The concern was if the heart of the people are given over to gods which are not true, that are false, then the people are not going to rely on the one who is sustaining them. And sometimes there's a temptation to rely on things other than what's sustaining us, which is God. That sometimes there's a temptation to pull you away. And the reality is, did Joshua get it right every time? No. They weren't perfect. It says that there's um, a story later on in the book of Joshua with these people, the Gibeonites. And what happens is they made a deal. They went to them and they got tricked. And the people, the, Joshua's like, wait, what? And what happens was the Bible says they did not consult the Lord. 
It says they did not consult the Lord. And in not consulting the Lord, they got tricked. And they were now in a place where it's like, well, I gave my word. And they kept the word that they gave. But the people, they weren't honest with them. And what we see in this story is that God does not require his people to get it right every time. Because the truth is, Joshua would have been disqualified. God would have said, well, you didn't listen to me, Joshua, you're cut off, you're done. But the truth is that although they messed up in that story and there's other battles that they lost where they didn't do things the right way, it says ultimately that every time they messed up, that the people came back and God kept them on this journey into the promised land. It says in Joshua chapter 23, verse 1 through 3, that after a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, that Joshua, by then a very old man, so now he's kind of sitting in the role that Moses had, where Moses brought the people together at the end of Deuteronomy, and now Joshua brings the people together at the end of Joshua. It says that he summoned all Israel, the elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and he said to them, I am very old. Verse 3, you yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. So before Moses was saying, remember what God did. You saw how God delivered you from Egypt, but now there's a new generation And now the story of Egypt becomes the story of the promised land. And the reality is that every generation should teach and remind the generation coming after them, here's evidence of what God has done. It's wise to sit down with your kids every now and then and remind them, hey, this is what God has done for our family. This is where God has brought us. Hey, remember, you didn't always have the nice shoes and the nice sneakers. That wasn't by accident that we have now. And even if you feel like you're in a spot where you're stuck, you remind them, here's what God's word says. That God has provided all things. That he is the one that sustains us. We see that Joshua is reminding the people, after all is said and done, you know what his innovative idea is in verse 6? His brand new idea, be very strong, be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Was that Joshua's original idea? No. If he submitted this as an essay, he would have got a failing grade. He copied it. That's plagiarism. I want to give you a piece of advice plagiarize God's word into your life. (laughs) Plagiarize God's word into your life. Take his words and place it into your story. Take his words and place it all through the plans. Take his word and place it all throughout your family. Why? Because that is the glue that holds it all together. I promise you in following God's word, you will not be led astray. I want to be very clear as I end out this message today. Joshua did a lot of planning. Kings in the Bible, they had entire councils. They had wise men who would help them. There was a lot of planning, a lot of thinking, a lot of hard work. The question is not whether or not we ought to plan. It's are we trying to fit the word into the plan? Or is the plan being sustained by the word that was spoken? The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Sometimes you have not because you ask not. Sometimes you don't have the plan because you're not asking for the plan. It's like God has given us his word. He's given what we need. And sometimes we simply have to ask. You might have heard it before. It's like, all right, I'm going to say a prayer once and for all, and I'll never have to pray again. Is that fine? Because God knows my heart, right? It's like, no, part of prayer is that we're relying on God. 
that we're speaking to him in an ongoing basis. So that when things pop up and it looks like there's no way forward, we can rest in the fact that God is the one who is holding us up, that it is his word that he is faithful to watch over. So as we close today, if there's anyone here in this room and you're saying, I want access to this God. I've never given my life over to Jesus. And maybe you feel like God is calling you home today. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer. We all pray it together. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.